Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. Today we're going to talk to Robert Reed, the founder of Rhapsody, the first streaming music service. So you're going to get some great behind-the-scenes stories about the Napster era, the early iTunes era, the early Spotify era. But guess what? That's only half of this episode, because it turns out Robert was the author of a book that was probably one of the biggest reasons I started doing this podcast in the first place. The book was called Architects of the Web, A Thousand Days That Built the Future of Business. It was one of the first books to come out about the history of the web era. I think it was published in 1997. I know I read it in college. I reread it maybe six or seven years ago. And it really helped give me the idea to start this podcast. If you have gone through the archives and you've seen those interviews, I got to launch the podcast with the Netscape guys, John Middlehauser, Alex Totic, all of them. I read about them in his book and I straight up cold emailed them. So that's how this podcast began. So on today's episode, you're going to get a fascinating fly-on-the-wall account of early Netscape, early Yahoo, all sorts of companies we've talked about. This is a really great episode. Please enjoy Robert Reed, the godfather of streaming music. Rob Reed, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. It is great to be here. All right, Rob. uh, One of the things that I enjoy is the sort of roundabout ways people come into their careers. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the fact that... Um, when you went to college, you studied Arabic and international languages? Uh, well, international relations. Relations. Yeah, so okay. I focused really, but I was studying another language. I studied French as well, but mainly Arabic. And I focused on modern Middle Eastern history. Mm-hmm. So that, that is usually considered to be a typical pre-Silicon Valley major. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, eventually you get the MBA at Harvard, so that's a little more conventional. But um, what's your experience with computers coming up, or were you nerdy or anything like that? You know, a little bit. So when I was um, when I was in uh, high school, actually junior high school, actually before that, we're going way back. So my I, I was I graduated high school in 1984. So that's mm-hmm. pretty early in terms of computer sure. history, at least personal computer history. And um, my father though worked in financial information services, mm-hmm. and as a result of that, um, way pre PC. He would come home, let's say in the late 70s, I'm maybe 12 years old or something like that. He would come home toting these massively heavy rectangles. And he'd thunk one on the table, you know, the whole house would shudder and dust would (laughs) tumble down from the ceiling. And it would be this typewriter looking thing. Mm -hmm. And he'd thunk the other one down. And that was just a box. And that was the modem. Mm. And so the way that a modem would plug into a computer in the late 70s was back then AT&T had a monopoly on all telephony in the United States, which meant that all telephones had a standard shape, which meant that you could plug the handset of any telephone into these sort of rubber receptacles that were on the back of this ginormous box. I mean, think of like a big square mid-70s briefcase size (laughs) and you could plug the phone into that and would go just as snugly as you know clicking a phone cable into the wall back when we used to do that and so that was the modem it was 300 baud right and uh, so I got I got exposed to computers well before most people did it's not unusual to be exposed to computers at age 12 today but back then it was extremely unusual and we could get online oh and by the way the thing that looked like a typewriter it was a typewriter basically and it would you'd put in this you know 500 foot scroll of paper and the way to communicate with the mainframe wherever it was is you would type stuff on that and it would type and then the computer you know in Schenectady New Jersey or whatever it was would reply back and it would type its reply so you ended up with these massive scrolls of paper that logged your entire interaction with the computer and so that was pretty early, and I got interested in programming basic then. Mm, okay. And I, got, I, I, I was derailed by the fact that every computer on earth at that point basically spoke a different dialect of basic. And there weren't any really good translation guides and so forth. So it just really, that, that, was, a, that was a lot of friction. If you learned on one machine, it might be a dead end. It might be a dead end other, when you got to the yeah. one at your school or mm-hmm. you got to your friend's house. And if I were a true programming ninja, and I certainly wasn't, um, that wouldn't have slowed me down in the slightest, but I wasn't, so mm-hmm. it did slow me down. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that was kind of neat about those days 
was it's way pre-internet. I mean, the internet existed, but there was no consumer internet. Uh, but we did have access to CompuServe, mm. and CompuServe had, you know, the what may well have been the world's first chat rooms. And it being the cusp of the '70s, uh, it was called CB, like mm-hmm. Citizen Band Radio. Mm-hmm. So you'd get on on CompuServe, and you'd get on CB. And again, this is not unusual for a kid today, or even a kid 20 years ago. But in the '70s, pretty unusual to be making friends in chat rooms. And I ended up making a friend who was the same age as me. Um, living in Palo Alto, California. No, I'm sorry, he was living in Moraga, California. And we became good buddies over chat. And I was, you know, I was pretty darn nerdy in junior high school. By the time I got to high school, I was much more socially adjusted. Uh, But, you know, it was still really cool to have this friend across the country when that was something that nobody else was doing. And the interesting thing is that guy, his name is Tim Knight. Um, He's the one who persuaded me to go to Stanford. Hmm. and went to Stanford undergrad in the middle of Silicon Valley and he's like look we're computer guys we have to go to Stanford and um, I kind of on a lark went out and visited him in Moraga and we went and looked at the Stanford campus and I remember it was like mid-February I'd come from New England Um, you know it was about 70 degrees perfectly blue skies and I remember driving up Palm Drive thinking you know, I think the academic program here is every bit as rigorous as anything on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. And so all that stuff was pretty influential. And of course, having gotten to school in the middle of Silicon Valley, time to study Arabic. <laughs> well, indulge me for one second, because I've talked to the founder of, of CompuServe, but I, I don't know that we've talked to someone that's actually used CB. Oh, gosh. So I just for it, a yeah. second, like, what did you go on for, like, in the context of what we understand going in, you know, message boards nowadays, like, yeah. what would you go on to seek out or to, were there, I know that it was divided into, into topics and things like that, but. It was really divided into channels. Okay. I mean, it was channels one through 40, just like yeah. the Citizens Band Radio, and, and you would go to hang out. So this wasn't a forum, it was live chat. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, it was live chat yeah. and you would go in to, you know, to see who was there and to talk with them. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of like people have done in chat rooms ever since. Yeah. But in those days it was a very self-curating group of people. It was mm-hmm. people who were using CompuServe in the 1970s. So it tended to be people who were very technical. It yeah. tended to be young adults. So Tim and I were very, very much on the young mm-hmm. side. Uh, it was an intensely safe advantage, uh, environment. There was no way pedophiles had figured mm-hmm. out that this was a thing yet, right? So you tended to be in these chat rooms with like the cool science teacher type uh. of person from your school. Huh. And you just drop in and everybody had handles. Like on Citizen Band Radio, everybody had like their own self-given nickname. So I was Hal 9000 mm-hmm. <laughs> and my buddy Tim was the Blue Knight, mm-hmm. his last name being Knight. And if you hung out there for you know several hours a week, you started to get to know different personalities and people had rivalries and this is and that's. And I remember there were ways to, um, if you wanted to encode your conversation, if you wanted to go private, mm-hmm. uh, you'd each type in the same password that you'd prearranged, you could do that. Um, and, uh, but generally it was, you know, and then there were like these sort of uh, schedules where like the French club is meeting at 8 p.m. Eastern on channel 17. So you, that was the topic basis to the extent that there was any. So you, if you wanted to type in French, you would go at you know, that time on Eastern time. And so, but it was never, they were never mobbed. I mean, if, you know, they were always, you go in any particular room and there'd be a handful of people there. Yeah. And it would be anything, it would just be kind of, just these kind of conversations with reasonably smart decent people and occasionally if it was all adolescent boys you might you know do a little beavis and butthead and talk Mm -hmm. about sex in Mm -hmm. a very Mm -hmm. chaste and inexperienced way Um, but it was a very sweet environment that's funny because i i can recognize that sort of i i mean maybe in retrospect it feels like edenic but you know like that's that early like being on uh bulletin boards and and things like that in the early 90s anyway yeah all right let's get back to your story so um Take me from uh, college to how do you end up at SGI? Yeah, so college, um, I did study Arabic. Uh, I was interested, it's, it's funny, like um, in a parallel universe, um, maybe in a majority of parallel universes, there are more STEM robs than non-STEM robs. Mm-hmm. I really was uh, best at science and, and, and math and so forth. My SAT scores reflected it. My grades were good kind of across the board, but I was really good at that stuff. When I got to Stanford, though, I was really interested in international relations. Um, I'd spent a summer in high school as an exchange student in a program whose philosophy was 
you know, we don't want to be a glorified travel agency for high school kids. Uh, so you can join the program. You can tell us where you want to go, but then we're going to tell you where you are going. You got to be ready for that. So I said, I'd really like to go to New Zealand. And they said, great, you're going to Cairo. Mm. So I spent a summer in Cairo, Egypt at 17. That really fascinated me. And that sort of started a snowballing. If I could go to Stanford expecting to major in Middle Eastern history, um, but I took one class, then another, then another, and it snowballed. And then when I graduated, I got a Fulbright grant and I went back to Cairo and I spent 15 months there and I got pretty darn close to fluent in Arabic. And I thought a little bit about maybe I'll be an academic and get a PhD. Foreign service, maybe? Um, foreign service was definitely very much on yeah. my mind. But um, that up close look, there are a lot of academics in Cairo in any given year, you know, people young like me, people who are professors, people at various stages of their career. But I got enough of a look at academia to realize fascinating it is, it's just not for me. And before I went, um, I interviewed on campus as a senior and I got a job at the consulting firm Bain & Company. Mm -hmm. And that was cool because they said, look, take your Fulbright, we hire undergrads every year, come back. And uh, so I did that and that gave me a path coming back from Cairo and got me on the business track. Uh, incidentally, one of the people I joined Bain with, had my first day of work with, was Steve Jervinson, mm-hmm. uh, who's now a celebrated venture capitalist. Um, and so we go way, way back. And then, you know, from Bain, you know, business school is a natural next step. And it was really in B school. I graduated in 94. Um, by the time I got there, I, I was like, okay, I'm not going to be a Middle East person. I'm really glad I did that. I'm glad. I, and I, by the way, I still go back to the region a ton. An elections observer. I've done all kinds of things, been all over the region. I'll, I'll always go back there. But it's like, I, you know, I am a business person and enough of being a generalist. I'm a liberal arts major, MBA is a very general job. Bain is a very, very generalist position because you're consulting and advising for all different industries. I want to go into an industry. And after a bit of soul searching, you know, all signs pointed to tech. I missed Northern California. I grew up in, I was born in New York City. I grew up in Connecticut, went to California, liked it, missed it. Um, I had, you know, lots of friends who were techies undergrad and Silicon Valley just was getting bigger and bigger and more and more of an article of fascination. Well, 94, 95, that's about the right time if you're going to catch this wave. It was great timing and I had no idea what great timing it was. So, um, I, I got to know the the other folks, the tiny number of people, I was was Harvard Business School, a class of, I think it was 850 of us. And... Only maybe a dozen had worked in tech coming in because this was before the internet boom. And graduating, I know exactly how many went to tech, eight of us. You can count us on your fingers, mm-hmm. no thumbs, eight mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. And four of us were all in a study group together. And the other three people in the study group had worked in tech before. And one of them had worked at SGI. And we did not a study group. It was an a, a independent research project. We did an independent research project for Silicon Graphics. That's how I got to know them. And as a generalist with an Arabic background, there's no way you get a job at SGI in those days unless you had spent a few months there doing an independent study and we researched the video game market for them. Mm-hmm. And at that time, SGI was pretty much the hottest thing in Silicon yeah. Valley. Apple had peaked and was deep into a nosedive at that point. Uh, it was pre-internet and Silicon Graphics had the graphics workstations and supercomputers that Hollywood was using in post-production more, more or less unanimously. I mean, it was pretty much total market share. Things like Jurassic Park and Terminator Yeah, Jurassic 2, Park yeah. and Terminator 2 and anything that was being used using digital special effects. It was all being done in Silicon Graphics machines, as was a lot of the high-end video game development. Uh, Nintendo, for the then current Nintendo box, they got their chipset designed by Silicon Graphics. It was the cool company. What was great about that is there was a high bar to get in, and as a result, it was a really smart, eclectic, competitive group of people there. Mm-hmm. And to this day, um, whoops, uh, to, this, to this day, the alumni group, uh, for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. of people who were that vintage, that sort of mid to late 90s vintage at Silicon Graphics, is an incredibly talented group of people. I'm still in touch uh, with lots of people from that era. So that's how I transitioned into tech. And shortly after I got to SGI, by you know great happenstance, um, SGI was one of the the two or three large tech companies uh, to first get onto the internet. And the reason was our founder Jim Clark co-founded Netscape right. with Mark Andreessen, and so he left right around the time that I was joining. And so this big company of five or six thousand people that hadn't been run by Jim for many years, like almost a decade. But he'd always been there and he'd always been somewhat revered as the founder and mm-hmm. I think he was still the chairman. And you know, 6,000 people paid great attention when Jim left. 
and went to do something else. And that something else was the internet. So 6,000 very smart people said, what's this internet all about? Mm -hmm. As a result of that, uh, I believe SGI was the first large uh, hardware manufacturer to put web browsers on every single computer that they shipped. Uh, we were definitely the first company to ship a line of computers that were specifically tuned to be web servers. So we had, this is a web server. It was one of our standard boxes, but with a lot of software tweaks and configurations made it better web serving. Um, the funniest thing, uh, the first graphical um, HTML editor, mm -hmm. you know, that you could just sort of like put things in place yeah, and yeah. have the H, the first one ever made, it was called, I think it's called Web Magic. It was made on SGI box, God knows why, but well, I know why, because we have brilliant engineers, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So we made this thing. And it's the only graphical web editor in the world. And so suddenly our workstations were thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. All of a sudden people, a lot of people are buying $50,000 Silicon Graphics workstations to do HTML editing because you know Adobe and Microsoft and Netscape hadn't come out with their dead simple editors yet. Mm -hmm. So we were very early into that. And I went to SGI because I wanted to be in a company that was big enough to touch every piece of the tech industry but just barely big enough to do that. So that could be IBM, but my God, you get lost. That could yeah. be DEC, could be Sun Microsystems. SGI touched everything and I wanted that because when I got in, I figured it would take me six months to get my bearing and then I know what's where I really want to be. And the answer for me was I want to be in the internet. And there was a tiny group of about a dozen people at SGI. I was probably the only dozen person group, internet group anywhere in the Valley outside of Netscape or Yahoo at that point. So that's how I got onto the internet super, super early by a little bit of you know, navigation, getting myself into SGI, and then by the dumb luck of arriving there just as the internet was taking off. And you manage the uh, SGI's relationship with Netscape? Netscape, yeah. So we, we now call that business development. Yeah, well, so, but, so Clark comes from there. I think he brings over Roseanne from there. Yeah, Bill Roseanne, Foss yeah, Roseanne there. you know, there's yeah. a bunch of people over. So yeah. was, that, was there any sort of tension there that like... Yeah, there is... was a little bit. So, um, you know, whatever tension, the main tension existed between Jim Clark and our CEO. Mm -hmm. And when Jim Clark wrote his autobiography called Netscape Time, he really lambasted Ed, uh, Ed McCracken, uh, probably unfairly to some degree. But that was so removed from a small fry, mm -hmm. right? And I think that you know Jim was certainly gracious enough to not hold his, his problems with our CEO against <laughs> us. The, the, the tension came in that uh, there were a lot of SGI alum over at Netscape. Right. And when Netscape got growing, they naturally, you know, had to do the deals that were right for Netscape. And as a, you know, as a practical matter, Sun Microsystems had far more market share than we did, and so did Hewlett Packard, and so did DAC, Digital Equipment Corporation, mm -hmm. when it came to servers. So although we were first, mm -hmm. and we really, really worked very closely with Netscape and getting their, it was the Netscape browser we put on all of our systems, not Mosaic. Yeah. Originally, it was in Mosaic, but, and we really sold incredibly. We had a great sales force. And we sold, when Netscape made a web server, it ran on all workstations. So it ran on us and Sun and everybody else. And the, you know, the tension became that like, okay, they're moving, they're moving more software on Sun. But you know, they're part of our lineage and our family. And mm -hmm. so I would get pressure from the highest levels of SGI. Like, why are they shipping this product on Sun first? It's like, well, uh, they're shipping it on Sun 10 days earlier and then they're doing the port from Sun Unix to R Unix. So it's not that big of a difference, but they're doing it because Sun's bigger. So there was a lot of, there was some, tension but I wouldn't say it went to the point of awkwardness we were always really well treated there and um, and uh, it was a very multi-headed relationship it became you know I was like you know this small fry right out of B school and Netscape was still a teeny thing that's how I ended up getting that job um, but then it very quickly became our most important software partner so that was again you know a pretty good stroke of luck yeah, for you, for your career. You're totally, sure. yeah. Oh, um, and I'd like to say for SGI as well, because look <laughs> who they had running it. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, it was a great circle lock, yeah. Um, so I, I said uh, I, I like color and things like that. And maybe you can only talk about this now with the benefit of 20 years or whatever. But yeah. um, what, was, what was the culture of Netscape like? What was the, you know, because... It, you know, I've said before that like they sort of set the template of what we think of now yeah. as like a web startup. Yeah. Um, but it was also just kids fresh out of college. Some of them were. Yeah. yeah. No, the interesting thing is it was a there was a quite a dynamic range in age over there because this was still in the early days of the internet. Uh, VCs were under the impression that you needed some gray, if not white, hair mm -hmm. at the top of any tech company. 
And so they hired a guy named Jim Barksdale, right. uh, who might have even been in his 60s at that point, and he had done all these grand things at Federal Express and then McCaw, McCaw Cellular, Cellular and so forth. And um, you know, so you, you you've got this sort of elder statesman type of person, and then you know, and then you have Jim Clark, who who was I'd imagine well into his 50s at that point as well. Uh, but then you have Mark, who's Mark Andreessen, who's immediately out of college, and then. There are five-ish guys who came with right. him from University of Illinois. And some people would say the co-founders are Jim and Mark. Some people would say the co-founders are Jim, Mark, and these other five guys. Mm-hmm. You know, that's up to them. I don't, I don't know. The dominant co-founders were certainly Jim and Mark. But you have these, you know, a, 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 quite a handful of guys running around whose claim to fame was that they had created the Mosaic browser, the first visual web browser. Mm-hmm. And they came to Netscape to basically, you know, make a commercial version of that. And so there, there was a very wide range of ages. And so when you think about people um, like Mike, oh, what's his last name? The VP of marketing uh, passed away. M- McCool? No. Oh, I know no, who you're talking that's about. That's Rob McCool. Yeah, Mike. Rob McCool, yeah. He had yeah. been at uh, one of the early t- tablet-based companies. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. The, the first, you know, the, 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 there was Todd Rulon Miller, who was head of sales. He had to be in his 40s or 50s. Mm-hmm. Mike, whose name I'm blanking on, had to be somewhere in his 40s. Like the, and, you know, I'm at this point right out of you know right out of business school I'm in my mid 20s so they all seem like really old folks yeah. so there were a lot of adults home yeah it wasn't the sort of crazy you know bunch of kids in, in a garage with red bull there there was that dimension to it so it was a very high dynamic range and um, you know this this might sound a little bit unkind but netscape had a had a very arrogant culture um, the there was in this interesting situation um, they kind of they were the, they were the coolest kid on the block and they knew it, and um, they treated everybody kind of like dirt. And there was mm. sometimes a lot of people felt that they were pretty duplicitous. Uh, I had a couple awkward moments. I managed the relationship well um, and didn't get jerked around too bad. But we used to joke there were there were quite a handful of us whose respective jobs and our respective companies was managing a relationship with Netscape. We almost started a support group, mm. um, and there was an interesting vibe in the valley in the mid '90s. Uh, it's hard to overstate the hatred that people felt toward Microsoft. Literal, like, tribal hatred. And um, I, I, th- that hatred was already there before I came to the Valley. So I can't tell you exactly when it started and how it got to such a fevered pitch. But people despised Microsoft. And they despised Microsoft because Microsoft had a long history of very, very underhanded, sneaky tactics. They had a history of knocking off others' innovations and then using their dominance in the operating system to you know, annihilate an innovative product with a third-rate crappy product that everybody ended up buying because it was Microsoft. Mm-hmm. And there were many, many stories of this happening. And ultimately, the most notorious and well-documented and you know, borderline criminal case was, of course, Netscape. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was a hatred of my, Microsoft that I never felt <laughs> myself. Um, but all my superiors within SGI and in other companies felt it. And so when Netscape came along and it became clear that the internet was going to be the competitor for the personal computer as a platform, mm-hmm. and I think smart people in the Valley li- realized that many, many years before you know, people started realizing that in business magazines and right. CNN and stuff like that, we realized it pretty early. There was a weird thing where directors and officers and board members of companies that had fiduciary obligations to their shareholders would literally, for emotional reasons, were, were cognitively disposed to do things for Netscape that were in their own company's hmm. disinterest to just you know, get Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, and I think Netscape was, in many ki- t- cases, very abusive about that. And because they can spin it as we're we're the David and we're the David. We're everybody they didn't have to spin it. Everybody knew that. But yeah. but, there but were, what I'm saying yeah. is is that so if you're if you're positing that they were naturally a little arrogant. Yeah. But they get a pass from people because they're almost like well at least these these guys are standing up to. Yeah yeah. Redmond and, yeah okay. And so they they ended up I think they squandered uh, I think that they're in their arrogance they squandered a great opportunity mm. uh, because at some point people did get exhausted. Yeah. And by the late 90s, people just rolled their eyes when people t- talked about Netscape. Maybe people would be like, I'm so sick of those people. Now, meanwhile, they did made... It get, cause, did it get worse like after the IPO and the, you know, all the press yeah, attention? Yeah, you know, like it's, it's hard to know. Um, yeah. 
I thought people, the people I knew inside of Netscape were remarkably level-headed about the IPO. Mm -hmm. I think it was just more just, you know, the hottest company yeah. since Apple, probably, yeah. Yeah. at that point. It had been a long time since Apple had been hot at this point. It had been a decade. Mm -hmm. And for those of us in our 20s, a decade was an eternity. That was when we were children, right? Yeah. So yeah. there hadn't been the consensus hot company in Silicon Valley in any of our careers. So just the enormity of that. And then when the the guys that came out of University of Illinois and so forth were five years younger than me. So yeah. there's just like, you know, there hasn't been the hottest company in Silicon Valley since I was in junior high and now I created it and I kind of permeated the place. And they made, um, Microsoft really shot insanely dirty pool, um, uh, really disgraceful in the way they basically looked at the things that Netscape was making and they said, well, what we'll do, making money on, what we'll do is we'll make a shitty version of that and we'll give it away for free and everybody will adopt our horrible product, their awful internet servers, their god-awful web browser, Internet Explorer, which was just a disgraceful piece of crap for years. Based off but we'll original. give it away for free right. to force Netscape to give their higher quality products away for free. And we're just going to keep doing this product after product after product after product until Netscape just has nothing to sell. And I don't know how that's not criminal behavior. I really don't. Um, and the court's actually found against Microsoft, but that's a whole other story yeah, that yeah. You know, other people have talked about. Um, but, but Netscape, in the midst of that, they also have themselves to blame because they did alienate much of the valley. Um, and the biggest thing was they had this flamingly obvious opportunity to become the dominant media property on the internet. Because when you fired up your Netscape browser and there was a period of years when everybody was on Netscape, you would go to a Netscape page. Mm -hmm. And very quickly became obvious that the thing that everybody was doing was search. Yahoo was the Google of those days. Mm -hmm. Everybody went straight to Yahoo because when Netscape loaded up, there was always this completely useless, un even to me as an internet insider, you would get up, you would, it would be like, Netscape announces LDAP protocol 1.1x with Carnegie Mellon professor. There'd be some kind of inanely narrow, boring, horribly boring article about some ultra narrow dimension of internet technology that even us insiders couldn't marshal our, 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 our interest neurons to care the slightest amount about. And so for a period of years, the world was being presented with whatever Netscape put in front of them and they put the most bland press release. It was almost like, I don't know, like a North Korean <laughs> official newspaper, you know, uh, Netscape announced it just, it, and as a result of that, suddenly everybody, as soon as they launch a Netscape browser, they can't wait to, to get the hell away from Netscape.com. And so they generally went to Yahoo and the Netscape did do something smart. They realized like, well, there's four competing browsers here. There's Excite, there's InfoSeq, there's AltaVista. There's Yahoo, there's Like Us, I guess there's five. Right, because initially they gave Yahoo the button by default. They did give Yahoo the button by default. And which then was, they start to charge. Which from a consumer experience standpoint was the right thing because that yeah. was the only search engine that was worth a damn back then. Yeah. But then they started charging everybody money and fine, you can, you can harvest that. But how narrow-minded to say, oh great, we can you know, make, I think it was 10 million bucks for a slot and all, all five of them paid the 10 million. How narrow-minded to say we can make 50 million in revenue this year mm -hmm. rather than we can own the eyeballs on the last medium. Right. You know, had they gotten somebody who was remotely media savvy, had they built a search engine, that's probably what they should have done. And it's not like Yahoo had an insuperable lead. Or had they bought CNET? Mm -hmm. Or had they bought Time Magazine and they'd gone more mainstream? Have they done anything other than what they did? Well, they, they would have built a business that was so much bigger than web servers that Microsoft was stealing from them. And, and I, I never, at the time, I never understood why they weren't doing it. Mm -hmm. And in retrospect, I'll never understand why they were doing it. They were cheated and robbed by Microsoft without any question, but they also missed uh, an opportunity that at least was obvious to a lot of us as we sat around saying, damn, I wish I were Netscape right now. Yeah. 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 Um, at the risk of yada yada in yeah. your career, I, I kind of want to go from this story right into Architects of the sure, Web. Sure. Yeah. Um, so first of all, where? Because I think you write a book before this one. You, I did. Yeah. Year one is that? The yeah, one? I wrote a book. Um, so I always wanted to be a writer. Yeah. And that was one reason why I didn't become a STEM person. Uh -huh. And um, I wanted to write fiction really from the beginning. But um, 
what I was able to do is when I was in business school, I was able to sell a book about what it's like to be a business school student because that was a lot of people going to business school in those days mm -hmm. and I wrote a book about that. And then um, I got to SGI and I became an internet person really early on. And again, this is like, this is the true writer in me. Um, I think 99.9% .9 of people with a normal or greater IQ would have said, oh my God, I'm here at the birth of the biggest thing that's gonna happen in my life. I'm gonna get a job at a startup, we're gonna start a company. I'm like, mm -hmm. I wanna write a book about this. <laughs> Uh, well, that's a good story. It's it, you know well, it seeing just, a good story right in front of you. You know. Well, it was two things. I, I I was as emotionally excited about the promise of the internet as I was about writing. Like I I was so awestruck by how big this was going to be, and I think most smart people who were sitting there at the precipice at the beginning could realize just the ginormity of this. Mm -hmm. And I loved to write, and it's like I just want to tell this story, and I know this is the economically stupidest thing I'll ever do in my life. Little did I know that I'd later become a podcaster. We'll come back <laughs> yeah. to that. Um, I know this is the economically stupidest thing I'm ever gonna do, but I have to tell this story. Even if 10,000 people read it, it was more than that. But even if just a few people read it, I, I need, the, the other thing that was great is I took eight months to write the book. Now, I came out of SGI, so as an internet insider, people knew me. I knew Mark, I knew Jerry Yang, yeah, yeah. not well, but they knew who I was, because it was right. a tiny You can get the access to You can get the, the access, theaters, right. right. And then I decided I was gonna write this book that would tell, that would make the world, I kind of was thinking about business school classmates, smart non-technical people who have no idea what's about to come. I wanna tell that part of the world, which was 99% of the business community. Mm -hmm. Holy crap, look what's coming. And the way I decided to do it was I'm gonna profile a handful of companies, turned out to be eight, and the entrepreneur behind them. Because the entrepreneur is the human face that makes the company accessible. But the companies were all very handcrafted, you know, hand chosen to collectively tell the story of the internet. So chapter one about Netscape, right. it's about Mark Andreessen, who's an interesting person. He's on the cover of Time Magazine that year. He, he's got a great story. That's the entry point to tell the story of Netscape. Holy cow, Netscape, what a fascinating entrepreneurial story. But mm -hmm. guess what, reader? I'm really telling you about uh, web software, mm -hmm. about browsers and why they matter. When we talk about Yahoo, I'm really telling you about search engines and why they're so important. When I talk about real networks, I'm not just writing about Rob Glazer, the founder, but it's really about audio on the internet. The Wired thing is really about how magazines and publishing are gonna transition right. to the internet, et cetera. Um, now, the other thing that was great about that, so the eight people I profiled most closely, I got to know them quite well, but I also conducted well over 100 other interviews. Uh, for most chapters, I conducted 10 to 15, yeah, probably 10 to 15 interviews. Most interviews were at least an hour. Um, and so I got to know everybody on the internet. This was the, the inadvertent genius of it. And so by the time I was done writing the book eight months later, I knew everybody who mattered in the internet in 1996. Mm -hmm. And then the book came out and it was well regarded and it was, I mean, it was just well regarded. And so I was viewed as this you know, credible person. And that, that gave me a great deal of flexibility in terms of what I did next. Um, I, I wanna mention it because it's a foundational book to this project. Uh, people that listen know that, but it's Architects of the Web. Um, I, it's probably out of print, but you can find it, of course. You can find it. Yeah, it is. Uh, alas, it is out of print. I intend to bring it back into print. I but really think you should. I've been working on bringing my first book back into print, which is a lot easier because it's just sort of memoir -y. And I've been 98% of the way done for over a year, and I just, you know, we get busy. You, I really think you should because it reads different now. Yeah, it's with a the piece benefit of history of 20, now. It's, yes. Yeah, it's and I'm very proud of most of the prognostication. Like, yeah, I, I went, I went through it earlier, not long ago. I'm like, damn. Like I, I was pretty good at how where I thought things were going. I want to mention a couple of the, th yeah. th the profiles in here. Let's do let's do Rob last sure, because yeah. I think that'll lead into. Yeah. Um, but like um, the Java chapter with Kim, Kim Blazy, yes. Yeah. Um, so that's seeing. I just did an episode recently on the history of Java. Yeah, that, like that's seeing like the development angle of like what is the technology, what is software going to make possible in this new medium. Yeah, and Java itself was a profoundly important development because it allowed platform independent software. Right. It never allowed it quite to the degree that we were hoping at the time, but it was really, really important. I think anybody who wanted to understand the internet in 1996 had to understand Java and why everybody was so excited about it. And Kim was the marketing lead on the team within Sun Microsystems right. that developed Java. And then she and three other people from that team 
started this company called Marimba, mm-hmm. which ended up being not the giant hit that they wanted, but it went public. It did right. great. And at right. the time, it was considered to be possibly the huge breakout, one it, of the huge breakouts. It was a, yeah. an intensely prominent company. Yeah. Uh, Kim was, without any question, uh, certainly the most prominent um, woman in technology at the time, and certainly, I'd say, a, you know, top five to ten entrepreneur in technology in terms of her prominence mm-hmm. and the seriousness with which every word she said was uttered. So being able, I, I ended up spending... I probably have seven or eight hours of interviews with her on tape, tape, cassette tape, <laughs> uh, and that was that was a great, great access. And she she became a very good friend as a result of that. We're still buddies. In fact, um, I spent a great deal of time with her at TED last week. Yeah, well, and yeah. Cindy, Cindy's tried to convince her to come on here too. So maybe one of these days we'll get to her. Um, another one that reads interesting now is the chapter on VRML. Yeah, that was the that was one of the few that I really one of the two really that I really missed. But I'm very glad I wrote the chapter. So VRML, people with prodigious memories might recall, was the markup language for 3D on the internet. Mm -hmm. So HTML, of course, is what we do for Mm -hmm. 2D. There was a lot of hope that the internet would be a major, major venue for 3D content. Um, That's finally probably about to start happening with virtual reality all these years later. But VRML, virtual reality markup language or virtual reality modeling language, depending on which you uh, subscribe to, it was viewed as being very foundational. And I was a bias for me of being thr- at Silicon Graphics because Silicon Graphics was all about 3D display, all of those you know wonderful 3D effects that we talked about um, in Hollywood and so forth. And so a lot of the work for VRML was happening in my own company, mm-hmm. and that made it prominent in my eyes. But the thing that's interesting about it is there was a war between Microsoft and the rest of the computing industry over what will be the 3D standard. Mm -hmm. And so that chapter, I wrote about this really fascinating character named Mark Pesci, Mm -hmm. who was a leading voice in the initial, you know, movement to specify what is VRML and what isn't VRML. So he was my kind of crazy window into this world. And then just documenting how a standard gets made in tech, which that chapter does is a pretty wild and interesting thing with these supposedly neutral third-party organizations. Like, we've got them in the internet, we've got them in in telecommunication, we've got them all over the place. It's an interesting process. So that was one that that VRML never became the thing. But man, 3D on the, interconnected online 3D, I think is about to become colossal with virtual reality. Just about well, years it's later. been the next big thing for twenty years. Now, and at some say. point, it will. At some point, it will actually. There was yes. a time when online was the next big yes. thing for twenty or years. Or video on the web. There was, was a time idea. when mobile computing was the yeah, next big that, thing right, for twenty exactly. years. Yeah. Um, if you could also give me um, color on Yahoo. Yeah, company. Yahoo. Uh, Yahoo was the Google of its day, and I started going there to interview Jerry Yang, the founder, Dave Philo, the other founder, and a lot of the senior people. They were still just 30 people when I when I was going over there. And it was mm-hmm. funny in retrospect to think they seemed so huge because everybody, everybody used Yahoo mm-hmm. constantly back then, much as they use Google now. And like, God, an internet company of almost 50 people mm-hmm. is huge. You know, mm-hmm. but you know, obviously huge has got a different frame of reference. What was really interesting about Yahoo um, was they took a completely different approach to search than their four competitors. So the four competitors all did what Google does now. They indexed things, but it didn't work back then. It worked very, very poorly. What Yahoo did instead is they had dozens of people eventually, just a handful when I first started interviewing Jerry, but even during the span of the eight months of the book, uh, they probably grew to hundreds of total people and dozens of surfers. They called them surfers. And surfers were human beings, Americans, sitting in Sunnyvale, California, looking at web pages, you know, collectively thousands and thousands and thousands a day and categorizing them in this huge, what they called the ontology, this huge mm-hmm. branching tree. And so Yahoo categorized websites by hand mm-hmm. with a cognitive person looking at that. And before we could do index-based search as well as we can now, that worked immensely better immensely better than InfoSeq or Excite or Lycos, who are all doing this kind of crappy index search. And the hysterical thing was, they would compete with each other. Like InfoSeq would say, we now give you 75,000 results for the average query. And then Excite would be like, (laughs) we give 82,000. It's like, who the hell looks at anything after 10? How could that possibly be a metric of quality? And so the way I described it in the book, 
was that Yahoo took this, this radically different approach and it was almost like they were the web's table of contents and everybody else was trying to be the index. And sometimes you need an index, but sometimes you need a table of contents. And when you needed a table of contents, something that was really pretty navigable and structured for you and, and you know, easy to figure out exactly where you wanted to go, you had one choice. If you wanted an index, you had five or four. And that gave, made Yahoo gigantic. And um, they really, really were in Super Bowl. Now, this is another company that ended up destroying itself through arrogance, even more than Netscape. So what happened was Yahoo was the darling of the internet, more than Netscape. It was kind of like this friendly, goofy brand. And also, we used Netscape as software, but we used uh, Yahoo was really our portal into the web. Mm -hmm. People started calling them portal sites. Um, Yahoo was the first company to start doing these really odious business development deals. Uh, they had it done to them by Netscape, and they thought it was, they, they were very better when Netscape did it to them, say, hey, Yahoo, it's $10 million to have a button on the search, uh, the search button on the Netscape Navigator. Well, Yahoo started saying, okay, so you're a marmalade company. Mm -hmm. If you want to be the preferred response when somebody searches for marmalade on Yahoo, uh, we'll just take 20% of your stock, an egregious amount of your money, uh, you know, this, that, and the other thing, and you know, the VCs are so dumb and blind, they're going to fire hose money into you. The investing public is so stupid that they'll let you go public, and you, you'll go public, and the only thing that anybody's going to look at in your S1 is, oh, you got a Yahoo deal. So because the markets have gotten so irrational uh, that they will reward a Yahoo deal in your S1, we're basically going to screw you to the wall and extract so much more value than you'll ever realize for that deal because maybe you'll realize it in the stock market. And they started doing that pretty early and there's a point in which it's like, hey, it's clever and that's rational and it's fair enough. Mm -hmm. They're going to get the people that they give a biased amount of traffic you know, uh, extra traffic, and that's going to have some economic value that might extract it. But they started playing that game as the bubble overheated and overheated and overheated. And AOL's doing the exact same thing. AOL's the same doing the time. same thing. Yeah. Everybody was grabbing yeah. what they yeah. could while they could. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't make it attractive. Yeah. That makes it um, understandable that you're grabbing what you can while you can, but that doesn't make it attractive. And when you have the biggest claws and you're shoveling the most goodies into your loot bag, uh, it's particularly unattractive, particularly when you're kind of in many ways the leading company on the internet. You're sort of you know, setting the tone in terms of is it about idealism about the web, which is what it was all about in 1995, or is it about slobbering greed? Mm -hmm. Yahoo's case was very much about slobbering greed by 1999. And it's made me sad because when I was writing this book, they were such a wonderful company. They were innovating so much to be like, they're like, wow, we could, we could create calendars for people. Right. How fun. And they really, we could do sports scores. They were the first people to put news. They, they really had this brand new vision. We're not just a search engine. They did this deal with Reuters. I want to say it was in 96 yeah. or 97. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're like, now, wait. I don't remember being like, wait, news on Yahoo? Mm -hmm. But wow, this works so well. And then weather, oh my God, it's stock. And they did all these wonderful, wonderful things. Well, some people have made the case that like that Reuters deal in particular is sort of the, uh, the commoditization of news. Could have know, been, but it was going to happen. It was going to happen. It was going to happen. And by the way, Reuters was always commoditized news to begin with. Right. Reuters right. was the news feed that you would put into nine. And they did a smart deal because they're taking uh, they revenue take equity. share. Yeah. Yeah. They took yeah. equity. And, and they, equity. They did great. Um, yeah. But in the context of today, especially one of the other things that they do innovate, which now you can look at as, is you know that my Yahoo stuff. That, they're the first people to do the personalization right. that allows them to sell ads against your personal yeah. data and things like that. But right, that's sort of that first um, where we make the deal. Well, I can have my calendar on here. I can get my local sports scores. There was no reason to go anywhere else. But I have to tell you where I am. Sure. Yeah. Who I am, my age, that sort of thing. And they so were very good at selling ads. Yeah. And, and, there was, and again, like sometimes I look at a company... And I say, how could you possibly blow this lead? And then they go and do. And so Yahoo ended up, um, uh, their, their product management ended up becoming catastrophic. They couldn't innovate their way out of a paper bag. I just remember, you know, eventually just like every time, I, even to this day, I still have a Yahoo mail account and I want to tear my hair out at the number of stupid, stupid product decisions they make. And, and kind of shame on them. Like they should have bought Google. Mm -hmm. uh, like, they should have paid any price. I yeah. mean, they, they were working with Ink to me to power their search. Well, well, wait a second. You're worth billions of dollars. 
You're a search company. Yeah. How in they the world that. have you allowed tiny garages with, with three kids in them outpace you in search? Yeah. Shame on you, yeah. right? Like, like Larry and Sergey were brilliant, but they were two dudes. And how could Yahoo, first of all, so the Inc. to me was, a, was a, another search only company mm-hmm. and they had technology. And Yahoo basically said, well, we're too stupid to search ourselves. We'd rather extort money from dumb companies going public. So we'll just outsource search to Inc. to me. How can you say that in 1998 mm-hmm. when the bulwark upon which you've built your business was being the best at search? Well, they said that. You might as well slit your own throat. Yeah. And then Larry and Sergey come along and they're doing search infinitely better than Yahoo. And with what, 1% of the headcount? And they wanted to sell at the beginning. There was <laughs> they, a time They when, were begging. So like, again, yeah. like Yahoo, they had a great moment. I, I loved them in 95, 96, 97. Mm-hmm. You know, they started losing it in 98. And by 99, they were an odious company. And by 2000, they were just a shamefully incompetent company. And then they just like this you know, this carcass, Mm -hmm. this zombie carcass for years and years and years. They could never get out of their own way. They couldn't create a product that didn't suck. They couldn't innovate. So it's too bad. Uh, Let me conflate Andrew Anker and Halsey Minor because they've both been on the show. They're actually both the same person. (laughs) I'm kidding. They could uh, not be more different. Yes, actually. (laughs) I didn't know you had those guys on the show. That's great. Yeah. Um, uh, Just your thoughts on people at this time, media people. Yeah and what they thought they were gonna do with the web and maybe where they got it wrong or well, well Andrew, Andrew and Halsey were two of the smartest people yeah. who got it rightest the earliest. Yes. So they're, they're bad case studies on what went wrong. Um, so Andrew, of course, was in charge of Hot Wired, which was Wired Magazine Online. And holy crap, I look back on that now. Wired was a startup magazine, you know, rickety, you know, hand and mouth new thing that was very hot and very sexy, but a tiny business. And when you look at the fact that this magazine raised, hired dozens of people to make a journalistic website, mm-hmm. um, Louis Rossetto and Jay Metcalf, the founders, how smart and gutsy and audacious, you know, and it's brilliant. And so then Andrew uh, was somebody who'd been a former investment banker. I don't know how they saw in him yeah. that he'd be able to pull it off, but yeah. he did. Yeah. And they built, you know, Hotwired was just this wonderful, weird collection of all kinds of things. Like they were trying to be too many things at once, but none of the things existed, so why not, right? Well, that's what I mean is this period of time where it's just like we're throwing things against the wall and seeing what sticks. Yeah, and they they were very bold about doing that. Mm -hmm. And although Hotwired itself, you know, never became a gargantuan uh, uh, generator of traffic nor revenue. They invented the banner. Yeah. They invented the advertising model. They invented so much about the model and they did well enough, in large part, view hot, through Hotbot, their ink to me powered search engine, that they did manage to sell to a deep pocketed, rather mm-hmm. dumb buyer, a Spanish telecom at the peak mm-hmm. and make a pile of money. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then Halsey was just, you know, is a very so Anchor was Anchor was uh was and remains a pretty low key guy, you know, particularly for somebody who in his twenties was running something that was as hot and high profile as hot wired. He was always pretty low key, very uh, uh, very smart, very gracious guy. Uh Halsey was, you know, kind of almost had a you know, he had a much more Wall Street type of energy to him. And he was much more exciting to be around at a party mm-hmm. than 99% of people. And he'd make audacious claims and, you know, stake out crazy goals. Um, but CNET, CNET was much more focused. It was probably much more, uh, a much smarter business proposition than yeah, Wired. Because yeah. Hotwire, Hotwire was trying to be all things. Yeah. CNET was like, we are very clearly, Palsy from the very beginning was like, you know, there's Ziff Davis, there's PC Magazine, there's X billion dollars spent on advertising mm-hmm. in tech-related magazines, that's what we're going after, period. Yeah. You know, whereas Wired was like, well, we're gonna be geek culture, and we're gonna be mm-hmm. um, Broadway, and we're gonna be entertainment, and you know, Halsey like, no, X billion dollars, here it is, this is the market that's gonna first adopt the web for written content, that's what we're gonna be all about. And he did innovate around the edges quite a bit. I mean, he did some really smart stuff with Download.com, right, yeah. software downloads. Um, interestingly, I always bought into the vision, and I wish they kept it up. They they thought that they would be a hybrid TV channel, right? And they did a lot of TV shows, yeah. and they were a little they were early on that. I think that had they stuck to that that strategy, 
and gradually built themselves up to the point where they were a full-blown cable network. Yeah. You know, the eventual collision of video with the internet, they would have been in an incredible position, but they, they ended up abandoning that strategy. And Halsey didn't run it for all that long after they went public. Mm -hmm. You know, he went on to other things. Uh, but he was, he was just, yeah, he was a, a, a very, you know, high energy, bombastic person. Um, he stepped on, he pissed a lot of people off, stepped on his share of toes, was fairly controversial. And I think that all of those things were probably pretty good for the company. Mm. All right. So let's do Rob Glazer now. Yep. Another person who's been on the show. Um, oh, really? Cool. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, because my assumption here is, is that maybe this is how you get into uh, your company. Yeah, so um, Rob, uh, Rob and his company fascinated me. So they were, they were, were created, it was originally called Progressive Networks right. um, and later became Real Networks. And they were doing streaming audio over the internet. And it blew my mind when I first saw that. I was absolutely flabbergasted. I remember sitting in my apartment in Mountain View with my friend Jeff Huber, who later became a very big deal at Google and founded an amazing company, a life science company called Grail. We we're just sitting in my room and I said like, you know, I'd, I'd been doing some stuff with Real Audio. I'd started interviewing Rob. I was like, yeah, well, Rob said that um, you know, he's got a radio station here in San Jose that's broadcasting live. And we were both kind of like, we'd gotten the idea that like, yes, we've been experiencing online audio. You can put it on a server and access it, but live seemed insane. Mm -hmm. And so I remember we, we found whatever the radio station was on Real Audio, and then we kind of chuckled like, let's turn on the radio. Like, it's mm -hmm. really going to be the same thing. It was the same thing. Yeah. It was in perfect sync. And I just remember Jeff and I looking at each other like, wow, mm -hmm. the world's going to change. And to me, the most emotionally exciting chapter in that book was the book about audio on the internet. Mm -hmm. Because I was a rabid music fan. I still mm -hmm. am. I always will be. And I started thinking about, you know, there's so, it seems like a lot, but there are actually very few radio stations in any metro area. And they've got to shoot for a very, very low common denominator. And by the mid 90s, radio formats were becoming just ghastly, just so boring and so formulaic. And there, you know, the notion of bands breaking out on really inventive radio stations with their own playlists or local radio stations, local music markets, that had all died. And music was really becoming a depressing wasteland. And, uh, you know, compact discs were getting out outlandishly expensive. There was so much that was wrong with it. And then to see the potential through real audio that, um, you know, that audio content in general, whether it was books on tape, nobody had thought of podcasting yet. We didn't even think of podcasting yet. But all the ways that music could flourish and you could have, you know, 900 radio formats. You could do things that were really personal. That got me so excited. And so I think that... One thing that was, was great about my background in writing this book is that people, during that, those eight months in 1996 when I was writing it, the internet went from weird geeky story to the biggest, hottest thing mainstream. And so all these CEOs were sitting down with folks who, who would literally, I remember talking to a major CEO, he said the last journalist who came in here was from one of the top publications in the world. And his first question was, so what's the difference between the World Wide Web and AOL? Mm -hmm. Holy crap. So I'd come in as somebody really, really, really deep background, having worked at SGI and done this stuff. And so I think Rob and I really connected. I, I, I might have been the first, you know, quote unquote journalist, first writer to come yeah. in who, and I'd also met with him at SGI. I, I'd entered, you know, I'd, I'd found out about Real Networks. We got their stuff running on our hardware. So we had a little bit of a business relationship beforehand. So we really, really mind melded. And that, that chapter thrilled me, uh, researching it and writing it and thinking of what could come. So how, how does that inspire you to do, to take, to, to take your own shot at it? Well, so, um, you know, that, that made me realize that music is going to happen in a very, very big and real way. And then after writing, so what happened was when I finished the book, um, I was a, a wildly hireable person, and I had job offers from places like Excited Home, mm -hmm. uh, which I actually introduced them to my buddy Jeff Huber, who I just mentioned, because I decided I wanted to become a venture capitalist. I had offers all over the place, and there was a venture firm that was then getting started. It was getting incubated inside a well-established venture firm called Hummer Winblad, mm -hmm. and I kind of always wanted to be a VC. Um, so I went over there, and I was there for two years. But I was a super, super junior person in a firm of just three people. Mm. And 
you know, there, there, there were structural issues, but really the thing was, as I got there, I started realizing because in part, in large part, because I'd spent eight months researching this book, but also because I'd been on the internet for more or less its entire commercial history, I'd gotten very good at detecting like, oh, this new thing. The internet is, is, is about to be ready for commerce in a real way. Yeah. You know, the internet is about to be ready for like local news in a way it hasn't been before. The internet needs something like what we had in, in um, in Silicon Graphics, it was proprietary software on our own network called Hey, H-E-Y, it was basically I am. Mm -hmm. It's like the world, okay, the, the network's fast enough now that it's gonna support something like Hey, what we had at SGI. And um, I was like, music's coming soon. And I don't know when or what, but when I feel like the moment's right, I've got to do that, because music, I was a guitar player, a guitarist, a songwriter, music, I put every dime I ever made shoveling driveways and mowing lawns as a kid mm -hmm. into music. And um, then I saw my first MP3 player, and then I had all this experience from writing and researching and thinking about real networks. Mm -hmm. And I stayed in touch with Rob. And then I saw my first MP3 player at an Internet World Conference, and that was to me, that was the click, because it's like, now you can get the music off the internet and into your life. Yeah. That is the last missing ingredient. And so I quit and I started my company, not really knowing exactly how we were going to expedite it, but feeling immense confidence that you know I knew enough people and had enough good relationships and I could hire a good enough team uh, that we, we could be central to music coming online. And, and here's where I was wrong. Um, I looked at the history of the music industry and I was awed by how deftly they had pivoted from platform to platform to platform. Mm. They went from 78 RPM records and then 45 RPM records allowed you to get more songs into disc and they jumped. Then 33 RPM records came out and enabled this whole new thing called a record album. That was like in the, before my time, but we knew that history, right? Yeah. And then cassettes came out and they enabled portability. Well, eight tracks before that. And yeah, then CDs yeah. came out and they had a whole set of... So it's like this industry jumps from platform to platform to platform pretty deftly. The internet is the last platform. No offense, Rob. That might have been the most wrong thing you've ever uh, It was pretty wrong, but it still ended up working out. But no, was... Yes, but I mean the fact that you expected that the industry would be open and receptive to, oh yes, let's try this new platform. Right? Well, they, they were until. So I started my company and um, people were pretty excited about the internet. They, you yeah. know, they, weren't, they hadn't quite figured it out just weeks after I started. So my company's called Listen.com. Yeah. Just weeks after I started it, Napster came out. Uh -huh. Weeks. Yeah. And Napster enabled this industrial level piracy of music mm -hmm. with, you know, at least it appeared to be zero consequence and, you know, just practically as easy as using Yahoo, right? And so what happened at that point was the labels went into a freak out lockdown. So wait, let me, let me stop you there. Yeah. So when you start Listen.com, you're naturally starting to have conversations with the labels. Started as soon as, you know, I, I needed to hire a team. But and yeah. they're receptive. They're, they're, yeah, they, it's very, I mean, we're talking about a few are, weeks. Are like, they just, are they just, we'll have sit-downs or whatever, or are they, are, you, think, think, you think maybe you can do business with them? Oh, I think I can definitely do okay, business with okay. them. Okay, okay. I think it'll, it'll take a year or two. Okay. Like, I think we, the first thing we need to do is come up with a product that's not reliant upon the major labels giving us content. Because right. it's going to take a year or two. Sure. But they'll, you know, yeah, of course. I mean, they went from vinyl to see. They'll, they'll get okay. there, right? Okay, okay. But, but also in the first, I mean, I think it might have been might have been as short as 12 or 13 weeks after I started the company that Napster came yeah. out. So in that time, you're still finding your office space. You're hiring your <laughs> VP of engineering. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're man with PowerPoint presentation for the most part. Um, but I did have a couple of, of relationships that I could go into, like on a middle level. Yeah. I think I called on Sony, um, and I called on BMG. This middle level, I'm like, yeah, we're we're attuned to this, and we know we need, you know, people who get the internet. This is interesting. And and basically, the first thing that we built was a, a Yahoo-like directory, which was there was all this music online, already tens, even hundreds of thousands of tracks in MP3s that was legally online. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was generally by unheard of audio artists mm -hmm. or, you know, some smart artists like Beastie Boys were putting out, yeah. Aerosmith were putting out a few tracks. And I felt like just as Yahoo became the UI for the early internet, we'll be the UI for this music. Like there's a lot of it out there. You got to find your way to the stuff that's actually going to appeal to you. And so I hired a bunch of music fanatics and we started categorizing it in a very Yahoo-like way. And I figured we'll do this. We'll get some traffic. Um, 
we'll continue our discussions with the labels and, and when they're ready to license, we'll be one of the you know licensees. Yeah. And that actually, weirdly enough, actually ended up going better than I expected. And I'll get to why in a second. Mm. Only it took three and a half years. <laughs> and the reason it took so long is out comes Napster. And the labels who had smart, mid to low level young folks nosing around this thing, suddenly grandpa in the CEO suite, you know, who probably dates back to the Woodstock, uh, has this total freak out mm. that it, it's like people are hijacking his trucks and dumping the CD. I mean, it, it's easy to look back with mockery at how foolishly the labels reacted, and they did react ultimately very, very foolishly. But it's important to remember that I don't think any industry had been disrupted so violently, so suddenly, and with something that was basically naked piracy. And at the peak of their power. At, at the peak the, of their the, power. The most yeah. money they've ever made. The most money they've ever made. Yeah. Uh, which kind of set themselves them up for the fall. I'm sure, mm -hmm. I think taxi rates in San Francisco peaked right before Uber. At some point, you make your product so repellently overpriced. Yeah. And the music industry, people knew that it was repellently overpriced, mm -hmm. and people were angry about that. And uh, they were not sympathetic victims as a result of that and many other things. But in any event, you know, like how long did it take TV to supplant radio? I made a slide of this once, I don't remember all the details, but like it took decades. It took decades for TV to supplant radio. It took decades for airplanes to supplant buses as a preferred mode of long distance mm -hmm. consumer mm -hmm. transportation. All the real trans, you know, the, all these things have taken decades. And now in the span of a few months, Literally, more music is going over Napster than is going through every retail outlet in the United States. Now, it was a major cognitive error to assume that each and every one of those downloads was a lost sale. Yeah. Because then you'd say, oh my God, well, the music industry was going to grow by a factor of 1,200% this year. Yes. And we would have gotten all that money, and now we're not. It's like, no, not all of these are lost sales. But you could understand the freak out. And then there was always this sort of thuggish dimension to the music industry. Because if you look back in the early days, 50s, 60s, Organized crime. Literal organized crime ties. Yeah, there was literal, there were significant elements of organized crime in the distribution of music yeah. and also in the relationships with radio. Yeah. Now in the, you know, sort of suit and tie 90s, those days are largely over, but you know, a lot of the people who who are senior got their date starts back then, and if they weren't actually thugs themselves, they grew up admiring thugs, right? Yeah, so there's yeah. a thuggishness about the music industry. And you know, there's sort of like a street fighter type of mentality, and there's this sort of this blind outrage that probably would not have been quite so blind, and might have been a little bit more open to deal making if it had been, I don't know, packaged snack food or something. But it's music, <laughs> and so the the terrible mistake that the music industry made was they were so angry at the internet that they 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 painted the entire thing with an identical brush. And so the original strategy, I mean, the documents probably exist somewhere, but I think the five CEOs got together in a dark room somewhere and said, okay, the strategy is gonna be, we're gonna shut our eyes and wish really, really, <laughs> really, really hard and the internet's gonna disappear. If that doesn't work, we're gonna shut our eyes twice as tight. And so what happens is that the music industry effectively embargoed their music from the internet uh, for a period of three and a half years. Now, we were there as the dorks in the white hats saying, we are not about piracy, we want to sell your product. And we think the way to beat, compete with piracy and to win it, win against it, is to provide a much better experience for a fair price. And the labels were like, absolutely not, we're so furious at the internet, we're not going to give those craven thieves, blah, blah, blah. So three and a half years is a plenty of time to train an entire generation in how to do piracy and also in how to be morally comfortable with it because there were these obvious and overwhelming advantages to digitally distributed music, in terms of the portability, in terms of the song selection, in terms of the fact you didn't have to spend 45 minutes doing an error errand, the fact that you could you know, dissociate songs. Whatever. There's so many advantages to this, and any music lover with half a neuron grokked those advantages, and anybody under 40 figured out what Napster was, and when a one month went by, and then five months, and then 10 months, and then a year, and then two years, and then two and a half years, and then three years, and it became flamingly clear that the labels were basically telling the world, if you want these advantages, you must do the following, pirate our music. 
There are all these advantages. The only way to get them is to steal our music because we refuse to sell it to you. So you can either not have any of these advantages. And that, what that ultimately did is I think it trained a whole generation of folks in college and high school to be morally comfortable with pirating. It's like, do I feel like a, an evil, immoral person if um, I get alcohol even though I'm not 21? No, many a college kid has said that to themselves. Uh, do I feel like an evil, immoral person if you know somebody won't sell me alcohol? They won't sell me music. I'm gonna take it, like mm -hmm. you know, whatever. So the labels really took a howitzer to their foot. We came to them very early with a plan that said, okay, you guys are uncomfortable with downloads, fine. Um, and there were reasons to be uncomfortable with downloads, but fine. Let's, let's get let's do your primal scream therapy. Do whatever we got to do. Get through the PTSD. We got this new approach, which is streaming everything on demand. Broadband is getting so ubiquitous and wireless is going to be there soon enough. We will stream this stuff so people won't be making copies of it and we'll give them all the music. And by the way, pirating something on Napster and then after Napster got shut down, it's because like, oh, it's kind of a crappy yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah. You got to download it four or five times. There might be broken downloads. You might get viruses. It's like we're going to make this this nirvana, this this you know, they called it the celestial jukebox, like it was God had created it. That wasn't our term, it's what we created. But the industry started referring to this idea of ours as the celestial jukebox. And, um, but they're like, no, mm -hmm. we're really mad about the internet. Well, finally, three and a half years later, while well, after training up hundreds of millions of people on how to pirate, we became the first company to get full catalog licenses from all five major record labels, even before Apple Computer did, because right. Apple wanted to do downloads and labels weren't there yet. So we released. Rhapsody mm -hmm. is the name of our service. Um, and during the time, it was really funny. There were these two other terrible companies. One had the catchy name of MusicNet. Mm -hmm. The other one was called Pressplay. MusicNet was backed by three of the five major labels. Pressplay was backed by the other two. <laughs> and this, is, this led to a great deal of consternation. And so it became pretty clear to us, and I can't prove this, but it came pretty evident to us that one of the reasons why the labels weren't giving anybody licenses to anything is they wanted these terrible companies to build services like what we were proposing. So they could lost, license, you know, the three major labels that back MusicNet could license their stuff to MusicNet and press play companies and vice versa. And then they could basically take over distribution online. Mm. So had they gotten away with that, they could have created a duopoly, mm. jointly owned by the five major labels, refused mm. to license us and everybody else who was going to them on bended knee month after month after month after month. And it started looking like, um, you know, significant restraint of trade. So I probably went to Washington, D.C. 20, 25 times um, in the time frame, probably starting around 2000, 2001, we were in this very delicate dance where we're being the white, like if you think it sucks being a record label in the era of Napster, yeah. try being us, yeah. right? Like who's gonna go to our dorky little, you know, music directory when Napster's out there, at least the labels can, you know, sell CDs to those who are still buying CDs, which is still a lot of people. So it's like dangerous as hell because we're not being Napster yeah. and our dorky, white caps are getting us no love from the labels. They're not licensing to us. We need them to license to us. We're doing everything we can. Then we suddenly realize like, oh, they're not licensing to us because they want to create a duopoly mm. that they own. Like they want to do this pivot where they come out of this, the physical retail channel, which they never controlled, is going to get nuked by the internet and yeah. they're going to have this duopoly. So we had to go to the Department of Justice and start talking about, you know, this clearly looks like monopolistic behavior. And so they knew we were going to the DOJ. We testified at the DOJ. The DOJ started an investigation of this. Yeah. And then there's all these weird countervailing pressures where we're getting ground into the, into, the, into the dust by Napster. The labels are getting wailed on by Napster. The labels are withholding the, the, the licenses from the likes of us because they really want to create this duopoly. We're being very polite to the labels, but we're still going to, it's almost like, you're being polite to the bully, but you still have to go to the teacher and say, the bully's really about to take my head off, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was legislation that was cooking in Washington, and so we were very involved. I was very involved in that, and other digital music companies like my own were involved in, in that, and meeting with congressmen and, and, and senators. And we were also very involved in this DOJ investigation and some of the things that was hysterical stuff. I'll never forget, we got a, a contract from one of the major labels that actually not only had the same exotic terms as the contract from one of their five competitors, four competitors, it had the same typos mm. 
that literally had the same typographical errors. So they're definitely colluding on There is no level. question they're yes. colluding. They yeah. are literally sharing around, like, I don't know where it crosses the line from civil to criminal, but this is getting awfully close. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately what happened was, I think the labels realized we're not gonna be allowed to create this duopoly. Hmm. Um, and it wasn't just us, it was lots of digital music, all the white hats, yeah. you know, um, you know, launch media, um, people like us. Um, there was a company called MyPlay. There were a lot of people who were just begging for it. So finally the labels, I think, got the memo that if you're gonna do this, you've got a license to a diversity of people Rather than retal you know, responding to Napster three months later with a far better experience, which would have been ours, and I think if they'd done that, I think if Rhapsody had come out with full licenses three months after Napster, there would have been a lot of piracy and a lot of people would have said, holy crap, this is so much better. We, yeah. but, but no, three and a half years later, it finally did. We got out, um, we got all five major licenses. December, before, December of 2001. Uh, December 2001 we launched. By the time we got the fifth major label license, which was Universal, it was probably July of 2002. Okay. So we, we, we launched with a bunch of Eastern European classical music. <laughs> um, but we, we launched, damn it, and we showed we could do it. And then the label started trickling in. We got some indies. We got one major, then another major, then another major. And I think perhaps for windows, reasons of window dressing, we got all five before Music Net or Press Play did. And MusicNet and Pressplay had such crippled, lousy experiences. I don't know anybody ever ended up using them. I mean, eventually they got them too, but we didn't even notice. Um, so we got out there with a product, and it was a working product, and it was a fully licensed product. And it was probably 10 years too early because everybody yeah. was very much in this download mindset. Why? Because the labels trained them to be, mm -hmm. because there were all these downloads for three and a half years, and they were all free. Um, and I think the labels set their own cause back by about a decade. I think. Um, you know, obviously now streaming, un unlimited streaming is the thing. We're sure. all using Spotify. I use Spotify. I love Spotify, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and Rhapsody is still out there, only now it's called Napster. That's ironic. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. but, you know, I, I think that by, in a sense, coercing all digital, all online music lovers, coercing them to use not only downloads, but only downloads are available and you have to pirate them, um, it took a, at least 10 years to unwind that behavior. Uh, and that mindset that the labels inculcated the world with. So at the end of the day, they could not have shot themselves more in the foot. It was terribly, terribly awful decision. But I keep going back that like we can't quite call them stupid yeah. because nobody had faced such a tsunami before or since. From, from Rhapsody's point of view, there's also that five or six year period where the iPod is the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. Um, does that sort of because you've hitched your horse to streaming and it's not quite there yet and everyone's still in that download mindset, yeah. was that sort of a problem for Rhapsody Oh Yeah, no, that time? hurt us because um, what happened, I got a, I've somewhere got a, this amazing quote um, from Steve Jobs basically saying, nobody's ever gonna stream. Of course, yeah, what does yes, Apple sell right, now, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a problem because um, you know the three and a half years of, of unlimited free music um, with no paid alternative really did get everybody downloading. And everybody's yeah. like, online music is, is downloads, period. Yeah. And that became a very, very established behavior um, that really took a great deal of, I mean, you know, these things, they change. I mean, it's, it's been, you know, it, several years later, downloads are pretty much over and it's now streaming. But you know, they don't change in weeks. So they, they take years. Yeah. And that became a deeply, deeply established behavior with people. Yeah, well, let me let me ask you about that in a second. Um, so, uh, Rhapsody sells to MTV first, or we no, sold, to Real I Networks. I sold to Real Networks. Yeah, so I sold yeah. the company to Real Networks, and then they sold half of it to MTV okay. uh, for like I think like a quarter of a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. um, that was after I left. I stayed about eighteen months. Okay. Um, and then it was like this sort of jointly owned thing for years and years and years, and then. MTV sold their stake to some Russian, I think. I'm now getting. Yeah. I'm now out long enough. I think Real Network still owns their half. But um, you know, the sad thing was uh, the. I remember looking at when I finally said I'm just going to stop using Rhapsody and use Spotify. Probably seven years after I sold it, and I just remember looking, taking my last look at at Rhapsody, which never ran well at all on the Mac. Maybe it does now, but. Taking my last look at it, saying, I, I hate to say it, but that's the product that I sold them back in 2003. Mm. Is the product didn't move forward at all. I don't mm. know why. Yeah. Um, I was long gone. Um, but there was just, uh, it, it was almost like the product had been dipped in amber uh, and put in a museum, the, the Museum of 2003 Technology. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so 
you know, there's still, so what ended up happening is that there probably was, I imagine there's probably board dysfunction. I mean, you got a company that's controlled by two very strong-willed entities, one being called Rob Glazer and one being called MTV. Yeah. Um, that's got to lead to a certain amount of dysfunction. And, you know, I don't know, I, I don't know really what went wrong, but the product didn't advance. I actually think that when I got an iPhone, I chose Rhapsody as the streaming <laughs> service that I signed up for. And, and yeah. So, acknowledging that you uh, weren't with Rhapsody very long or whatever, so you might not be able to answer this, but yeah. if you had any thoughts on why you think Spotify was the one that was able to outlive, outlast, or whatever the, the survivor yeah, thing yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think it, it, was, it was, oh, the other thing I do know factually from the outside was there was, there was a new CEO every year, for years and years and years over there. So, you have a lot of management churn. Uh, yeah, what it was was the complete inability, the the, the complete inability of the, the product to evolve. Yeah. And so by the time Spotify came along, it just worked, you know, just all the sort of rounded edges, you know, it just worked faster, cleaner. It just didn't feel like this, you know, gooey thing from 2003. I mean, what we made in 2003 was a freaking miracle um, in 2003. But when Spotify, I think it came over in 09, maybe a little later, maybe 2011 came to the U S yeah. say years later. Yeah. And it just behaved like what we then in those days when Spotify came over, web 2.0 was still a thing that we, a term we used felt like a web 2.0 UI, you know, it's just like click, click things happen very, very quickly. Um, they did, I, I still think Spotify could do a far better job of social, much better job of social. But at least social was integrated. There was nothing like that. Well, at least they had the embeddability early on. Too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Now, the other thing they had um, that was that they were an extravagantly well-funded company that could you know, afford to bleed $100 million a year. And Real Networks is a publicly traded company. Couldn't do that. Yeah. You know? And so they, by being private and not having a public share price to worry about um, and being, you know, very much a you know a market darling and so forth, they were able to inhale and lose billions and billions of dollars. I don't know how many billions they burnt in total. Um, I don't even know if they're profitable yet. I know they just went out. Those, yeah, no, that details not profitable yet. So they they were they were able to raise untold billions of dollars and burn each and every one of those dollars. Um, we never had that luxury. We burned our share of dollars, uh, but Real Networks is a public traded company. Couldn't do that either. Yeah. Um, but really, I think if the product had kept up. Um, Spotify wouldn't have had that opening. The other thing was Real never launched internationally, uh, mm -hmm. at least not while I was there. I was there for 18 months. They never got themselves into another market. I don't, I'll never understand where, that compla understand where that complacency came from. But it was very clear, like our market, the United States, um, 2003, 4, 5, was so far ahead of the rest of the world in online music that you could be forgiven for thinking this is the market that matters more than any other. But you couldn't be forgiven for thinking that in 2008. You couldn't be forgiven for thinking that in 2010. And by now, hopefully, Rhapsody's watched in other markets, but there was, you know, while I was still at the company, there was nothing I or anybody could do to get real even remotely interested in launching in a foreign geography. And so, you know, Spotify got to preponderant market share in Sweden of all places. Yeah. And once you get, you know, they crossed a certain tipping point where it was just part of the culture of that relatively small market, but it's a freaking nation, yeah. you know, and, um, and, and yeah, so they, they were sleeping the switch internationally in a big, 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 big way. Uh, well, I want to end talking about books, podcasting, all that yes. stuff. Um, before we get off that, when you, this is sort of, you know, a Barbara Walter style question. When you look at... The fact that streaming is what we all do today. Yeah. What is it? Is it a mixture of we were just too early or I was right, damn it? Well, much more the latter. Yeah. I mean, if you look at my career, almost every decision I've ever made has been to do something that fascinates me rather than something that's going to make money. And by the way, I'd, I'd include going into high tech in 1994. Um, that seemed to be a financially ingenious move, but the fact was I turned down one of the most desirable jobs coming out of Harvard Business School, which was McKinsey San Francisco, to take a literally, it was, it was top, uh, you know, top five percentile in terms of the job, what it was paying, to take bottom five percentile income at Silicon Graphics. Um, when I probably should have taken the job at Excite at Home, I decided to sit down and spend eight months writing a book that I hope maybe 10,000 people would read. Mm -hmm. um, we invented the model that made Spotify rich. You know, we created this unlimited um, on-demand streaming model. 
And I love that. I love the team I did it with. I still see the team I did it with all the time. We probably get together as a, as a crew three or four times a year. Um, and, you know, Daniel Leck gets to be a billionaire, and that's great. But he didn't invent anything. Mm -hmm. And I feel that our team, collectively, we invented something very special. We invented the mechanism by which the world now listens to music. And I, I've never met Daniel. I'm sure he's a great guy. I wish him all the well in the world as a multi-billionaire. Um, you know, he, he's going to have a wonderful life and that's cool. I'm glad to say that we were there first. Mm -hmm. Even if, um, and, and it is nice to be right. We, we felt as a group, you know, my senior team and I, so vehemently that this was the way the world should consume music. And it's nice to be vindicated. Just as the team at Silicon Graphics, of which I was a teeny part and a super junior person, we'd sit around in a room in 1994, 1995 and kind of pinch ourselves and say, this thing's going to be huge. Like none of the people we went to school with, none of our families understand it, but this would be huge, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. We were right. It's cool. What's attractive to you about experimenting with web shows and broadcasting and, and podcasting and things like that? Oh, it's so... Um, well, so let's talk about yeah, the pod. Yeah, yeah let's, so jump, jumping forward, um, I'm glad I started a company. I'm glad I started Listen.com. I'm glad that we as a group built Rhapsody. I'm yeah. proud of all that stuff. Having summited the mountain once, I don't have any reason to go back there. Much mm -hmm. more personally, uh, more of a creative person. You know? And so now I write fiction, um, and I write uh, doing some screenwriting. Um, and that's kind of what my heart always wanted to do. That's why yeah. I was writing books when I was in business school, and yeah. I was writing books when I was starting a web company. So I wrote my first science fiction novel um, several years ago, and it was about a vast alien civilization that is so into American pop music that they accidentally commit the biggest copyright infringement since the dawn of time, thereby bankrupting the entire universe. It was obviously primal scream therapy for all the crap <laughs> yes. I went through with the music labels. That's what it was. Excuse me, that's what it was. And there's a great TED Talk also on a somewhat There was a very theme, playful yes. TED Talk on a related topic. Um, and I figured I'll self-publish this thing, and maybe Larry Lessig and a couple people from EFF will read it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it ended up becoming very, very, very briefly and very barely a New York Times bestseller, because mm -hmm. it's a playful, fun book. You haven't mentioned the name. Uh, it's called Year Zero. Yes. It came out in 2012. And it's a playful, fun book about these music-loving aliens, and that's kind of why it, it, it reached broadly. My more recent book, came out in August, it's called After On, mm -hmm. and it's a much more ambitious book. Um, and it is, you know, I'd say it's more like, more literary fiction than the first one was. It's almost 600 pages long. And it tells the story of a diabolical social media company, mm -hmm. embodies everything that's wrong with social media, dialed up by about 30 or 40%, which is not easy to do, uh, set in present day San Francisco. And about midway through the book, the media, the social network, attains consciousness, mm -hmm. and basically becomes, rather than a genocidal terminator intent on killing us all, being a social network, it becomes something a bit more frightening, which is like a hyper-empowered, super-intelligent 14-year-old mean girl. <laughs> and um, and it, so it's playful on a certain level, but it, is very, it gets very, very deep into some very serious themes, like super AI risk, uh, the promise and peril of synthetic biology, um, quantum computing, what's sex and dating going to be like after Tinder, lots of sociological, political, lone wolf terrorism is a major theme in it, mm -hmm. kind of harkening back to all the time I spent in the Middle East and some things that happened then. Um, so it's a lot of stuff that's, that's integrated. And you know, I knew what I was writing, it's probably taking 7,500 hours to write this book. And if there's, if there's a worse way to make money uh, than to write science fiction novels, it's writing 600 page mm -hmm. science fiction novels, right? But this was, um, I like telling stories, and this was kind of the pinnacle of what I think, certainly what I was capable of writing at that during those years of my life. And I really, really loved integrating very serious looks at these profoundly transformational technologies that we're on the cusp of realizing. It was a lot like writing Architects of the Web because I conducted a lot of interviews with smart people in these domains that I didn't understand, like synthetic biology, yeah. like neuroscience and consciousness. And that was the delight of bringing those two things together. Um, so the book came out. It's done, you know, rather well. It's not did, a New York did Times bestseller. Did we mention it? After on. After on. After yeah. on. Yes. Sorry. Book came out in August. Um, it probably peaked at number fifty on the Amazon charts. It didn't get anywhere on the New York Times charts, but you know, tens of thousands of people uh, have read or are reading it, and that's fabulous. And as part of the process of writing it. Um, I got really excited about some of these topics I researched and I figured, well, I can't really embed, you know, 20 pages about synthetic biology in the book, although there's a lot of synbio in the book. 
So I'll do eight podcast episodes in which I re-interview some of the experts that I met and interview some new folks and just sort of wrap it around the book, you know, eight really interesting deep dives into, you know, into topics related to the book. And about midway through that, I realized, you know, again, a typical theme, I don't know how I'm going to ever make any money at this. I probably will not. But I really love this process of sitting down yeah. and interviewing, which I got good at, you know, doing this 100 interviews for Architects of the Web. And I hadn't done any interviewing since then. And I also really loved the preparation for each interview. Uh, I do 20 to 30 hours of prep for each interview because mm-hmm. the topics are so disparate. Um, I might be talking, you know, about... <clears throat> um, you know, something like, you know, how might we create new senses using, you know, sort of sensory gateways and modern neuroscience one week and, you know, be talking about like, what is cryptocurrency? Why does it matter? Where is it going from here? just did a recent one on the, G- the genome and things like that. And yeah. 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 And I just interviewed, um, last episode was uh, George Church, who's arguably the world's leading bioengineer. He's yeah. got a huge lab at Harvard. He has he is invent- co-invented CRISPR, yeah. it's gene editing technique. Um, he's co-founded over 20 companies, you know, like I'm going to spend 20 hours getting ready for that conversation. And then I'm going to have a fabulous interview over a period of hours. I'm going to edit it and turn it into hopefully a freestanding gem that can teach people a ton of stuff, just like these chapters in Architects of the Web. And I'm in love with the process. I'm in love with the learning. Uh, it's amazing to be meeting, having access. I recently interviewed Rodney Brooks, who's arguably the world's leading roboticist. You know, I didn't know a lot about robots yeah. and I didn't know Rodney. Um, but this is kind of a cool calling card. So I will at least, I, I, I'm up to 25 episodes now. I, I couldn't stop at eight. I'm up to 25. Um, and I'm going to see if I can wrap an economic model around it to put up a Patreon page. Um, I've got about 300 backers now. That's a hell of a start. That was just a few yeah, weeks ago yeah, I put that yeah. up. Um, I haven't done advertising yet. The audience isn't big enough. I'm yeah. probably at about 20,000 listeners now. I think I need to be closer to 50 in order for that to happen. So I'm going to see if I can get there Mm -hmm. over the next few months. And if I can't, I'll never regret doing this work. Uh, But if I can, I could see myself being very happy doing this for some period of time. Well, I mean, (laughs) this is a good way to end. But the way I started this podcast is in Architects of the Web, I learned the names like Alex Tatek, John Middlehauser, Rob McCool. Yep. And I reach out to them. Yeah, and those are the first episodes of this podcast. Really? Oh, and Mike Homer. Mike, Mike Homer was Homer. the name of the VP yes, of yes, marketing yes. at, at yeah. Netscape. Yeah. He passed away. Yeah. So, um, so directly, this show, this project, comes out of you know what? I wonder if this person would talk to me. I wonder if this person would talk to me. And so now we're. And they often do. You're going to be episode 170, I think. So. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, listen. Oh, and I should, I would like to mention, for those who are interested, the name of the podcast is also After On. The book, the most recent sci-fi novel, book, yep. After On. And the, the podcast. podcast, After On. Yep. So, you, uh, listening, you know what to do. You and Rob Reed, R-E-I-D, ID, that's the other yes. thing. People don't always know how to spell. Read intuitively. Uh, the links to the book and the podcast will be in the show notes. Um, Rob, thank you for, I mean, this is a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Episode. Great context on the history, um, but also thank you for the book and, and putting me down this road. Absolutely. I'm glad that it's been a productive road for you. So far, it's been fantastic. So far, so good. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes, because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at nethistorypod, and my personal Twitter is at brianmcc. Thanks for listening.